been reading in my daily devotions and my plan has me going through several different books at one time. And I don't know, this time as I've been reading through, there's been a word that has caught my attention. And, uh, I've, and, and the way the children of Israel handled this word and all these things that took place around it, uh, it has been amazing to me. I've been doing some study on it. And uh, that word is manna. I know it doesn't sound like a really neat word, but uh, when you think about the word manna and what it is and the size of it and what all it means and uh, the children of Israel, what they did with it and how they responded to it and these things like this in the wilderness, you'll find that there's a lot of great things that we can learn from manna. And I want us to see here... In Psalm chapter 78, we're going to start reading at verse number 18. Uh, we'll find out here a little bit in this passage. You say, I thought that happened in the book of Exodus. Yes, it did. We'll get there. But this is a recount of uh, what David was telling in Psalm 78, starting at verse number 18. It says, And they tempted God in their heart by asking me for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel. Because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven. Man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heaven, and by his power he brought in the south wind. He rained flesh also upon them as dust, and feathered fowls like as the sand of the sea. And he let it fall in the midst of their camp, round about their habitations. So they did eat and were well filled, for he gave them their own desire. You'll find that when you are asking God for something for your own desire, and God gives it to you, here in a minute as we continue reading, you'll find that it comes with a price tag. Notice verse 30, they were not estranged from their lusts. But while their meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. We find in this passage a situation which actually this is a retelling from David uh, of the, the children of Israel as they were in the wilderness of Exodus chapter number 16. This is the, the feather fowl that it speaks of here is the quail that God sent to the children of Israel after they had been griping and complaining and murmuring about what God was not doing for them and how they thought that they had just been done wrong by God. But I want us to take some things and, and look at this passage. and I want to take it verse by verse and compare some other scriptures with this. Verse 18 I want you to notice that it says they tempted God in their heart by asking me for their lust. Now, I don't believe that it was a sin that it was wrong for them to ask meat for God, from God. I don't believe that that was the problem. Okay? The problem was, what was it? Their heart. Their heart. Because why did they ask for this meat? For their own lust. In other words, they, it wasn't because they didn't have a real need. Did the children of Israel have a need? Yes, they did. They did have a need. They were hungry. You say, where do you find that? In the book of Exodus. Turn over there now to the account of the book of Exodus in chapter number 16. Keep your finger there in Psalm 78. Turn over with me over to Exodus chapter number 16. Let's read here. Exodus 16, the first three verses. <clears throat> it says, And they took their journey from Elam, and, the, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after 
their depart, uh, departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died in the land uh, in the hand, uh, by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So what was their need at this point? They were hungry. Now, almost all of us would agree, I believe that even every one of us in this room would agree, that a starving person is somebody in need. When somebody is hungry, there is a need that needs to be fulfilled. But now, you need to understand that just because you have a need in your life, you need to realize that there is a proper way to go about asking for God to fulfill your needs. Children of Israel didn't do this. What were they doing? They were murmuring and crying. Oh, I just wish we would have died. I just wish we would have died. Just, just, just a, and he, once we died in the, at least we had food in Egypt. We could have died over there. Even though we were slaves and in Egypt, at least we had food and we had meat and we had all this stuff. They're looking back to the past. Which, by the way, Egypt and the Old Testament represents the world. They're looking back to the world and all these things. And look at where we are now in the wilderness. We don't have any food. What have we got anyway? We just would you just rise here just to die of hunger. How many of y'all know hungry people become grumpy people? <laughs> My wife knows that. Hungry people become grumpy people. But that doesn't excuse their murmuring and complaining. Amen. Doesn't excuse our attitude. Amen. Just because we have a need and something happens that we don't like, it doesn't mean that we can go grumble and murmur and complain about it. We can go to an almighty God and ask for His provision and His help. But we better do it with the right heart and the right attitude. And we find here that they had a real need. They were hungry. Sometimes we have real needs. Sometimes it may, it may not be always hungry, but it may be a bill needing to be paid, uh, needing to go help somebody, needing to uh, pick something up, needing to do this or do that, or needing to make sure this job gets done, this project gets done. And there may be a real need that comes up in our life, something happens in our own life that we can't control. But how do you handle with that thing? Do you start grumbling? I can't believe you let this happen. Why? God will do that if something happened to me like this. Or do you take time and go to God in humble prayer and ask Him for Him to guide you? They didn't handle their need properly. They began to cry. God had a plan for the, to supply the need of the children of Israel. Now, this is something that we need to remember. That when we come into a place in our life where there is a problem and a real need, remember this. God already has a solution for your problem you're facing. Amen. He already has a solution. God did not go, oh, i got to feed the children of Israel. That's right. I knew I forgot something. He didn't do that. He had a plan. What well, was his plan? Manna. Manna was his plan. That's how he planned to sustain. As a matter of fact, he did. For 40 years in the wilderness, God provided manna for the children of Israel. And that was his plan. Sometimes the plan that God has for us is not what we want. They didn't want the manna. They wanted the meat. I did some research about manna and I learned this. Some observations about manna from the Bible here in Exodus 16, you're already there, verse number 14. It says this, When the dew that lay was gone up, behold, on the surface of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the horror frost on the ground. Now this was God's plan to sustain and nurture physically the need of the children of Israel. This thing called manna. Manna was not a 16 or a 12 or an 8-ounce steak. It wasn't, it wasn't steak and potatoes. It wasn't that. It was a small, round thing. I, I did, some, did some research about hoarfrost. Basically, I, I found this about hoarfrost because I wasn't real sure what it was, to be honest. Hoarfrost is this, though. Uh, first of all, if you ever, out here in the, in, in the wintertime especially... When you drive out here, coming uh, from my house towards the church, you look up here on the left, uh, Caroline, we talked a couple times, and you see up on the mountains, those, like those white trees, they're like frozen, those white, okay, that up there, those frozen ice particles, 
that turns white, that's hoarfrost. Okay? Now the whole tree isn't one big hoarfrost. It's a bunch of them, millions of little bitty, and they're very small. And you, you learn this by the passage because it says it was a very small round thing. It was a small round thing they found. So hoarfrost itself, that's what it is. So when you drive by and you see the iced over trees, not just the clear eyes, but not the white glaze that you see on there. That's the hoarfrost that you see. Hoarfrost in its size is dependent on the temperature at night. And in the wilderness, it does get below freezing, so there are some uh, that happen. Now, the best educated guess, and I've done quite a bit of research on this, the best educated guess that I could come to my mind to compare, because I like to visualize things, uh, that I could compare, that I think man it may have looked like, comes in the form of a little cereal. And I brought me a little sample of it here. This is Kit. Y'all ever had Kits? This is, this, this is the best, this is the best I can, this is the closest. It's not real big, it's a small round thing. It's about the size of a piece of horror frost that it would be one. This is one. Now, how many of you would look at one and go, yeah, that's what I want to eat for 40 years. <laughs> Man, give, give, me a, give, me the, give me the kit, you know. I mean, it's kit test, mother approved, give it to me, you know. But this is the closest I could find to this. Could you imagine what it would be like to walk and you see not just one, though, there would be millions of them scattered all around after the dew, it only came after the dew melted, and then there was this little round, and he had to pick them up. You see, even in the wilderness, God provided them, but you still had to work for your food. Amen? <laughs> I believe in working for your food. Yeah. All right. But they, they saw that. And I don't believe that this would sit well with them whenever they're realizing, you remember, they're looking back at, at least by the flesh pots in, in Egypt. See, the flesh pots, that's where they had their meat and stuff like that. That's why they're wanting quail. Can God give us meat in the wilderness? They weren't satisfied with the small round thing. Now here's, here's where to me it gets very personal. Because there are some things in my life I think it's just very small. And I'm like, God, I, but I want this. this. This would help me better. I mean, really, you know, you, you could really help out if you would do this more for me. And you're just giving me this. It's just a small thing. But we need to be thankful. We'd be thankful for the manna that God gives us every day. See, manna appeared every day in their lives. Yes. Supplied their needs every day. Amen. It wasn't always the big grandiose thing they wanted. But it was a small thing. And we need to take time and say, Lord, I thank you for the manna that you placed in my life today. I thank you for the small things that you've done for me. Because, see, whenever you have the small things in your life, how many of y'all know Many small things make a great big thing. Yeah. So that whenever the trials of life come your way, you look back and you say, God, you still gave me manna. And if you did it then, you'll do it now. But too many times we, we put the manna aside and go, I don't want the manna. Lord, give me the quail. Lord, give me the quail. I mean, it seems like the world has a quail. It seems like they have the bigger. You put a, you take a piece of manna and you put it up next to the quail. Which one's going to be bigger? Quail. Lord, give me the bigger Thing. Lord, I want this. This is what I need. And that is our lust. We need to realize we need to be satisfied with this, even the small things that God gives us. And be thankful for the small blessings in our life. And don't discount it. How many of y'all were able to wake up this morning and make it to church? Yeah, everybody in this room. Everybody in this room. You ought to be thankful you were able to wake up this morning. You had a vehicle or had a way to get to church. You're able to sit here. There's a lot of people that can't do that. Yeah. And we take that for granted. We ought to be thinking for the fans of the air conditioner we have in our church. There's, there's churches all over the world that don't have what we have. Okay. Well, I don't have much. But you have manna. You have manna. Well, if I, would, if I could just do this, this would be bigger for me. And I could get here and I could, I could grow in this and I could do that. Let's be thinking for the manna first. And if and when God decides to give us the quail, He will. The problem is we're not satisfied with, and this is way off my notes, but I'm preaching that this is the same topic. We get, we get so sidetracked with wanting the bigger 
Yeah, we forget that video is not always better. Amen. What's the small things that God's done for you that you can be thankful for? And then when a crisis comes your way, remember it. See, that's the one thing about manna. Whenever, whenever it would disappear every day, and it, it was amazing because every day it would come after the dew would, would subside and it would melt. You'd have these little round things. And you would go and you pick it up. And if you ate it that day, you're fine. But Moses said, you better eat what you take that day. Because if not, and you think for the next day, it'll be rotten. And you'll find that there are some of the people, children of Israel, in the same chapter there in Exodus 16. They didn't believe Moses. You know what they did? They gathered more than they were supposed to. They stayed up for the next day. The Bible says there were worms and rotten. It was nasty. Sometimes we try to hoard all the little blessings that God gives us. Let's not be a hoarder of God's blessings. Amen. Let's share God's blessings. Amen. Let's share God. What, what has God blessed you with that you can share with somebody today? What is it that God has given you that is, even though it's a small thing that you can use? Has God given you a little extra time that you can use to serve somebody else? Has God given you a small ability you can use to be able to encourage somebody to do something? What has God given you? You say, it's just a small thing. No, it's not. Little is much when God is in it. See, they were given this, but it didn't sit well with them. They wanted more. They wanted something bigger. They wanted something what they thought would be more filling. They wanted that quail. They took one look at that food. And I can't say the word manna does mean it is interpreted in the Bible. It means, what is this? That's what it means. And, and I don't, I can't say for certain the attitude which way, which, with which they said that phrase, manna. But I tend to think after listening to them gripe and complain, they see the little white thing and they go, manna. What, what is this? What, what is this? God, we want something more. What is manna? Well, this isn't what I wanted. We wanted something bigger, something more grandiose, something more filling, something that we could really do something with. And what? Manna? What is this? Do we ever do that to God? Well, if God doesn't do this and this and this and this for me, I'll tell you what, I won't do this and this and this for God. If God gives you this, you go, manna? What? God, no, this is not what I asked for. Sometimes God gives us a trial and we go, man, Lord, I did not want a trial. What is this, Lord, man? But it's God's way of helping us to grow and to be sustained. They took one look at that little food on the ground and they went, man? See, the problem was they were so focused on their present need of hunger that they didn't focus on God's ability to supply their need. And we need to realize that we need to focus on the God that is the supplier of our needs more than we focus on the needs that we need supplied. See, in our text, we find in verse 18, they tempted God by asking for this meat. Now, in Exodus chapter 16, verses 12 through 16, we find this. I turn back. Let's turn back over here to Exodus 16. There we are. At verse number 12. Notice what, what God did. And the Lord speaking to Moses, verse number 11, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, speaking to them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh. In the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at the even the quails came up. That's the meat that they wanted. Quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the war frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna. For they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the bread that God wanted you to eat. This is the provision that God had planned for you, not the quail. This is it. 
But in our text, in verse number 19, we find that they doubted God. They doubted God. Verse number 19 says this, Yea, they spake against God. By the way, when you doubt God, you speak against Him. We don't, we don't always think of it that way. Well, I'm a good Christian, but when you doubt God, you're speaking against God. Because whenever you say, well, I don't know, I don't know if God can do that, you're speaking against the God that you love, or you claim that you love, the God I claim that I love. Whenever I speak, and I grumble, and I begin to gripe and complain, I am speaking against my God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? They're focused on their present problem. Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? I mean, has God reached the end of his power? Can God not do anything else? Can he not give us food? He did these. But can he not give us just food? That's all we want. He's done these. Can he provide flesh for his people? You hear they're griping and they're murmuring and they're complaining. And we go, shame on the children of Israel. But we're just as guilty as they are. Yes. Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel. Because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven... And had rained down manna upon them to eat. And had given them the corn of heaven. They doubted God even though they knew all the great things God had done. Well, I know God has brought the water out of the rock. And I know that God has done all these different things. But can God do this? This is too much for God. Even if you remember, even Moses himself began to doubt God a little bit. He's like, God. Oh, I, this is not, I didn't birth these people and they're mine and you're placing them in mine. I can't handle this. And God, you're, how are you going to feed everybody on this quail that you're going to tell? God said, you go tell the children of Israel that they're going to have me. And Moses goes, how are you going to do that, God? What, what are you going to have them kill all their cattle? What are you going to do? But God said, I will show myself to be faithful. The problem is when we focus on our solution, the quail, to a problem and not wait on God, we lose sight of who God really is. We lose sight of who God really is. Yes. He is the supplier of our needs. Matthew 6, 31-34 says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or where thought shall we be clothed? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. How do you get your needs supplied? By focusing on God and His kingdom first. The problem is we focus on our own needs, and then when we have any time or any money or anything left over, then we'll give to God. It's not the way to do it, the Bible says. Children of Israel in the Old Testament didn't come and harvest all their food and give God their leftovers. God's not a pig that you give them your scraps, even though we treat them that way. Amen. Well, God, if I have enough, if I have enough time, then I'll come and I'll have a visitation. God, if I have enough money, then I'll be able to help you give to the mission. Lord, if I have enough of this, if I have enough talent, if I have enough of this, if I have that or if I have that, then if I have anything left over, then it's yours, God. Let me just give you the scraps that I have, God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And He will be the one to supply your needs. They gave God their first fruits. The very first thing that they harvested, they gave to God. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient to the days, the evil thereof. James says this, he asks, and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your own lust. Your lust. You, you ask just for your own lust's sake so you can have it. As I can children of Israel, Lord, what you supplied is not enough. I need this. And you begin to lust after what you what God does not want you to have. Lord, I know 
you gave me a, a little car, but Lord, if you just give me something a little bit bigger, something a little bit newer, something with less miles on it, if you just give me this or give me that, it's a little bit better, then God, I'll tell you what, then I'll be able to do something. No, you're not wanting for something bigger so you can serve God. You're wanting something bigger for your own lust. Yeah. Let's stop playing spiritual Christians here and start getting down to the bare bones of what it's really about. Let's be thankful for the manna. You say, are you saying that we all ought to go and have the worst run down car? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that godliness with contentment is great gain. Let's start there. And when God gives you the bed, and when God gives you the quail, when God gives you that steak, when God gives you that other great thing, then be thankful for that. But He won't give you these other things until you're thankful for the manna. Amen. And if He does give those to you, before you're thankful for the manna, you better watch out. Because His judgment's coming. Again, it wasn't the meat that was the sin for asking. It was why they asked for the meat. Their lust. It's not a problem. It's not a problem if you want a bigger house, a newer car, a different boat. That's not a problem. The problem is, are you lusting for that newer house, that newer car, that newer boat? Are you seeking the kingdom of God first and then getting the newer car, the newer house? Or are you trying to get the newer house, the newer car, the newer boat, and then whatever you have left over, you give to God? That's backwards. Amen. As we think of what God gives us, godliness with contentment is a great game. Sometimes God gives us what we ask for, though. Notice in our text, verse 25, as I wrap up. Verse 25. The man that eat angels food, he sent them meat to the full. He gave them what they asked for. He caused an east wind to blow in the, in, in the heaven. And by his power, he brought in the south wind. He rained flesh also upon them as dust and feathered fowls like as the sand of the sea. And he let it fall in the midst of their camp, round about their habitation. So they did eat and were well filled, for he gave them their own desire. Did not give them his desire, he gave them their own desire, gave them their lust. Because the Bible says they were not estranged from their lust. That means they got exactly what they asked for. You may get that new car, but you better watch out because bankruptcy may be around the corner because you're not able to pay the bigger payment. You may get that newer thing. You may get this neat toy. You may get that new idea or this new promotion or this, but you better watch out if you lust after it. You may, you may get what you ask for, but notice they were not estranged with their lust, but while their meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them. They couldn't enjoy it. They got what they wanted. They couldn't enjoy it. You say, how do I know if what I have now, if what I have now is something that I'm blessed for or something that God's given me? Let me ask this number one. Can you really actually enjoy it completely without any guilt? When you're spirit filled. In your flesh you can enjoy just about anything. I'm talking about when you're spirit filled. Can you get out there and say, this is a blessing. Can you enjoy? Because when God gives you your lust, you're not going to be able to enjoy it the way you think it is. You're not going to be able to. Because it won't be good enough. You want something different. The wrath of God came upon them. Notice though what he did. His judgment fell and stood the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. <clears throat> That's the result of their sin. See, we need to learn that God can do miraculous things with something that we think is small. In, our, in, in the book of Exodus, chapter number 16, verses 16 through 18, this is incredible. Take your Bibles there and, and turn as I read it. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Gather of, ev gather of it every man according to his eating. An omer for every man. Now what's an omer? It's about two quarts. This. This is about an omer. And that every man was to gather this much manna for the day. This is, their, this is their ration. God began rationing their food. And that was their ration. That's actually not too bad. But for all day, <laughs> you kind of began to wonder. But God knew what he was doing. And over, about two quarts, there it is. According to the number of your persons, 
So each person, it wasn't an owner per house, it was each person. So in, in my household, we have six owners. Okay? According to the number of your persons, take you every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so and gathered some more and some less, because not everybody has the same amount of people in their house. But notice this. And when they did meet it with an omer, probably the two courts, he that gathered much had nothing left over. And he that gathered little had no lack. God took something small and supplied the need for those that had many and supplied the need for those that had few. He did something miraculous with something that was small. He fulfilled the desire of those that had many. And they didn't have anything left over. They gathered a bunch, but they didn't have anything left over. Their needs were supplied. And those that had few, their needs were also supplied. They gathered every man according to his need. <coughs> Don't discount that God can use the little things in your life to be a great blessing to many other people. He can take your small blessing and your small talents and your small gifts and use it to be a blessing to other people. Jesus fed 5,000 people with just a little food. He changed the life of one demoniac and used him to change the whole countryside. He used only 12 men to spread the gospel through the whole world. The testimony of two men in the Bible were that they turned the world upside down. Jesus noticed the little widow's might above all the other men that was given. God can take the small things and use them to do great things. Of course, Corinthians says this in chapter 1. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and, uh, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. That, uh, that no flesh should glory in His presence. But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. What you have is not yours anyway, it is God's. So you give it away and you give glory to God. You say, what are you trying to say, Brother Caleb? Today... I'm trying to get you to simply do this. Don't ask for the question. Just be thankful for the manna that God puts in your life. Thank you, Lord, for the small things. Amen. Stop seeking the quail and start thanking for the manna. I wonder where we are today, church. Are we too busy seeking the quail? Well, if God does this and I have more free time, then I'll, then I'll go on visitation or I'll help somebody or I'll do this or I'll teach a Sunday school or I'll... Uh, sing a special, if God gives me this, then I'll do that. <clears throat> what about the small things you have? you have anything you can do to serve God with? In the church, at your work? Anything? You tell me you can't, you can't take your hands and do this on the carpets? Do this in the toilet bowl? Oh, that's gross. It's man. It's a small thing, but God can use it for great things. My parents were custodians for many years in the church. One thing I understood quickly is nobody knows the custodian unless the toilets were messed up. <laughs> it was manna until it became a problem. It's those little things that we do. Amen. Can you not do anything small in the church? Can you not do something small for God in the church? Start with that. What can you do? Five heads and close your eyes. Nobody looking for you. <laughs>